we have a tremendous lineup for uh, panel number five um, out of seven, Renewable Energy. Um, as a reminder, we also have the exhibition space. So if you haven't yet been over there, I would definitely check that out. There's a lot of great stuff happening, uh, a lot of great uh, people wandering around, and um, it's just a fun environment. Uh, we will also have uh, a reception starting at 5 o'clock. So if you're kicking around Rayburn at 5 o'clock, we can help you find something to eat and have a little drink. Um, we are, are, are doing great on time. We've got a lot of resources um, and uh, additional pieces of information that, uh, whether it's on the website or past briefings. But we're going to go ahead and get started. Panel format, just to give you an idea for those of you who are new to the policy forum today, uh, we are going to dive right in. We've got five great speakers. We're going to do five minutes each of oral remarks, and then we are going to have a discussion. Um, we're probably going to run a little bit past 2.45, but that's okay. Hopefully, we'll have a special guest stop by during the session as well. Um, so if you have questions, please wait until after Carl, who's our fifth panelist today, is ready to go. And then we'll do our best to get everybody included in the discussion. Um, so I'm going to introduce our first panelist, uh, and it is Eric Lance. Uh, Eric is the director of Wind Energy the Wind Energy Technologies Office, multiple. Uh, at the U.S. Department of Energy. Eric, like I was saying, I think you're like DOE speaker number eight today. Uh, so you've, you've got a lot of uh, big shoes to fill, but I'm really looking forward to hearing what, what's going on in the Wind Technologies Office. Great. Well, thanks, Dan, and, and thanks, everyone, uh, for being here today. Uh, as was said, I'm Eric Lance. I'm the director of the Wind Energy Technologies Office at DOE, and uh, hopefully I'll have some new content for you. Um, I'm also sort of in, in proxy representing our broader renewable energy pillar, uh, which includes our wind and solar office, as well as geothermal, uh, water power, and a grid integration group. Um, the focus of our pillar really is on generating all the clean electrons that are going to support the energy transition. Uh, the last panel I know is on transportation. It, it needs a lot of clean electrons to support the elect electrification of that industry, uh, many other industries, as, as well as load growth. Um, specifically for the Wind Energy Technologies Office, uh, we're really focused in terms of our future vision on making wind energy more accessible, more sustainable, and more secure. Uh, we're also really working very hard to make wind energy a source of value to the power system and a source of prosperity to the American people. Uh, we really want this homegrown energy resource to be available and beneficial to, to communities all across the nation. Uh, in order to serve that vision, uh, we conduct a, a wide variety of work. It's probably similar to a lot of other, the other DOE comments that you've heard so far, but I'll just say real quickly, uh, our specialties are in foundational science, so really doing underlying science that can be picked up by other researchers in industry and then turned into innovations. Uh, we do some work in the technology innovation and validation space. Uh, we also do world-class analysis focusing on the evolution of the electricity system to understand how wind energy is going to uh, play a role in that future. Uh, and, and we're also uh, working with engineering analysts to understand uh, what types of technologies are needed for the future. Um, another key part of our portfolio actually is our collaboration and capacity building uh, work. Uh, we try and convene uh, stakeholders from across the wind energy space, as well as affected uh, other sectors with equities uh, that intersect with wind, uh, and bring them together to solve sort of complex multidisciplinary problems. Um, if, you've been, if you know anything about wind energy already, you know that there's been a lot of successes over the last couple of decades. Uh, I got into wind energy when there was about 9,000 megawatts in the system, and today we're at a over, over 150 gigawatts, so a lot of growth during uh, my tenure. Uh, today, wind energy is one of the lowest cost sources of new electricity supply. Uh, turbines have changed tremendously. A turbine today will generate four times or more uh, energy than what turbines uh, in the past would have. Uh, they're far more sophisticated machines. Even though they still look pretty, pretty similar, they're, they're far more sophisticated. They can both actively and passively uh, shed loads, which helps us drive down material intensities uh, and adapt turbines for a broader array of sites and wind resource conditions. Uh, on the offshore side, in the US, we now have tens of gigawatts of offshore wind in the pipeline, uh, of the development pipeline making its way towards uh, ultimate uh, construction and commissioning. Uh, we're trying to foster a nascent uh, floating sector as well to open up new markets, open up terawatts of new clean electricity uh, generation capacity for the U.S. and the globe. Um, in addition, in terms of the successes, uh, again, when I got into wind energy a couple decades ago, uh, the utilities were very concerned about adding any wind energy to the system. Well, today it's about 10% of our national electricity supply on an annual basis. Uh, in some of the wind-rich regions of the country, it's more on the order of 20 or 40%. 
And we even have daily uh, penetrations, again, for, for windy regions of the country, uh, of approaching 90%. So there have been 24-hour periods in SPP uh, when wind energy has been almost 90% of the electricity provided across the region. Um, lastly, I'll say in terms of the successes, we have documented evidence that wind energy provides a lot of uh, benefits uh, to communities where projects are hosted, specifically around employment uh, and wages. We actually have a new study out uh, from our colleagues at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, that is one of the big, broadest empirical studies in this uh, genre, uh, and it does a great job of documenting both uh, the employment effects and the wage impacts for communities, which actually are particularly beneficial for uh, black and Hispanic workers in those regions. Um, so, of course, we're really grateful for all the investment that's been made in, in wind energy in the public and private sector to bring about these successes. Uh, but looking ahead, we have some really massive challenges, uh, and I'll try and go quickly through these. Um, yeah, we have to scale the industry. Right now, we install about 8 to 10 gigawatts a year. Sometimes we have better years, sometimes we have worse years, but it's an average of about 10 gigawatts a year in the recent past. Uh, we need to go probably to somewhere between 30 and 50 gigawatts a year if we want to achieve our nation's clean electricity goals. So we have to do a massive scale up in terms of the production of the technology. Uh, we also have to uh, complete our work in offshore wind and floating offshore wind uh, to open up the, the offshore segments and access those clean electron, electro, electron potentials. Um, and we need to tailor uh, land-based wind turbines so that they can be better situated in the local context uh, where they're going to occupy uh, space around homes and people and communities, uh, and they're also going to have to work to, to avoid wildlife and minimize the risks to wildlife. So we need turbines, land-based turbines that can be a better neighbor for our ecological and, and human communities. Um, just two other big challenges. Um, you're probably familiar with what we need to do in terms of transmission. Uh, transmission is relatively important across the renewable energy offices at DOE for wind. We're relatively geographically constrained as com in contrast to, to solar, which is also geographically constrained, but just not quite as much. Uh, and so transmission is really important. Uh, transmission and distribution, actually. So wind is often in rural locations, uh, and, and there's opportunities to bolster the distribution system as well as transmission. Um, the last piece I'll say is that we, need, we also need new business models. So in terms of uh, challenges and opportunities, uh, we're looking at how can we better integrate communities uh, into the development process. I heard I was on a, uh, at a workshop recently uh, with uh, members of um, the co-op community as well as the, the farm bureaus, and there was sort of a sentiment that the energy transition is being forced upon them, and they're not active participants there. And so we need to work uh, to bring those segments of society along with the energy transition, make them active participants and drivers of the future. And so we need new business models uh, and economic structures that can uh, enable their participation. Uh, I have given you a wind-specific lens here, but these are not uh, exclusive challenges to the, to the wind office at DOE. Uh, certainly, some, there's some significant similarities here with our colleagues in the solar office, uh, as well as water power and geothermal. So with that, I look forward to the questions. Thank you, Eric. Uh, next up is Malcolm. Malcolm, you know we, we would never dream of doing a renewable energy panel at ESI without having hydropower part of it. Malcolm Wolf is the president and CEO of the National Hydropower Association. It's always great to have you on an ESI panel. It's great to see you. There we go. All right. Uh, well, I take back everything good I just said about you. <laughs> um, let me quickly try to do a, an intro to hydropower, uh, what, why we're critical to the grid, particularly as we go through this energy transition, and what I lose sleep over, because I do think there are some threats that are not um, fully appreciated that folks, particularly those interested in grid reliability and resilience, need to care about. So intro to uh, hydropower and water power. We currently provide power to about 30 million Americans. It's about 30% of US renewable energy, 96% uh, of long duration energy storage. Pump storage, while I love batteries, pump storage is still the long duration, kind of anything over kind of four hours. Um, 80 gigawatts of hydropower on the grid, another 22 gigawatts of pump storage. So together it's over uh, 100 gigawatts of carbon free generation. Globally, hydropower is the largest source of renewable energy, larger than all the other sources combined. Um, let me quickly uh, share with you three reasons why it is safe to fall in love with hydropower again. 
Um, first is it keeps the lights on. Um, I already mentioned the 100 gigawatts of hydropower that's out there. Um, it's also dispatchable. So unlike some of the, it really complements the other renewables because it can fill in when wind and solar can't. So there was an incident, this happens you know, fairly routinely, uh, Martin Luther King Day this, this year in the Pacific Northwest, polar vortex. Um, suddenly they're having record winter time peaks. Hydro can release its water, provide power when it's needed. And at that same time, the wind died. Um, so at the same time that wind wasn't generating what it usually does, hydropower is there to be able to fill in. So we help keep the lights on. Second reason to fall in love with hydropower again is system reliability. Um, for those of you fellow energy geeks and nerds in the room, all of the ancillary uh, grid services, what I call the essential grid services, um, whether it's black start to restart the grid after the load, if, if the grid fails, or spinning reserves or inertia, right now we've got plenty of it, courtesy of coal and natural gas. When those cycle off, as we continue the energy transition, we're suddenly gonna need all of those essential grid services. And there's been numerous reports that hydropower is kind of the only renewable that provides the full array. Um, but for example, if we're 7% of overall electricity load, we're 40% of Black Start. And we don't really get paid for that. So we provide essential grid services for keeping the, the, the reliability of the system. Finally, third reason why you should fall in love with hydro again is we are carbon free. Um, overall, even looking at just the last 10 years, we've offset more carbon than any other renewable resource. Um, it is, would be a huge step backwards if we lost the existing fleet and all the great gains that wind and solar are making, if we lose 100 gigawatts of, of hydropower, uh, that would be a huge setback to dealing with uh, the climate crisis. Let me share as well a common misunderstanding, misperception that hydropower may be tapped out. Department of Energy, your colleagues in EERE uh, did a study a few years ago. They found the potential for 50 gigawatts of new hydropower using the existing infrastructure. I'm not talking about building new dams. We haven't done that in 60 years. I'm talking about using the 90,000 dams that already exist for flood control, irrigation, water storage. Let's use it for power creation as well. Or off-site closed loop pump storage. Lots of opportunities for new generation. However, there's a few challenges. First, lack of, of parity in the tax code. Love the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, it provides great resources for new generation, great resources for existing carbon-free nuclear. Nothing for existing carbon-free hydropower. We need to restore that parity. There's bipartisan bills introduced in both the House and Senate on that. We've got an antiquated licensing process. It takes over eight years on average, often over decades. We've got a hearing with Senator Manchin tomorrow. I'm hoping we're gonna be able to address add some provisions into that bill to try to address some of that challenge. And we also have market design problems. We're not paid for the flexibility we provide. The example I shared of the Pacific Northwest over MLK weekend, we don't make any money for doing that. The grid assumes we're gonna do it, but when people are making decisions about whether to continue their plan or not, that's not always uh, something they're paid for. And that's, I guess, my, uh, my uh, penultimate point, half the fleet is up for relicensing in the next decade. I'll repeat that, 459 facilities are up for relicensing in the next decade. When you go through relicensing, that's when you're gonna make a decision about voluntarily surrendering your license. We could lose this fleet. Uh, every climate model I've seen assumes that hydropower doesn't grow. It also assumes it doesn't go away. I think both of those assumptions are wrong. We have a huge potential to add dispatchable carbon-free power to the grid, but we may also lose that. And in fact, my members are telling me in surveys, almost 40% of them are actively looking at decommissioning, voluntarily relicense uh, license surrender. Good news, we've been working with our colleagues across the aisle uh, in the environmental community, in the tribal communities, in the dam safety communities, through something called the Uncommon Dialogue. We've agreed on the three R's, retrofitting for power, rehabilitating for safety, and removal if the facilities are no longer serving a useful purpose. Together, we're working together on the bipartisan tax piece I mentioned and bipartisan license reform legislation, and I think we could have a bright future together. I'll stop there. And if you want more Malcolm, you can come to our briefing that we had a couple months ago and watch it online all about uh, river restoration and dam removal and in many, much more detail about the three R's. Uh, and we, uh, Representative Ann Custer uh, was a part of that session along with Tom Kiernan with American Rivers and others. So. That's, uh, if you can't get enough Malcolm, which I understand, uh, we, have, we have you covered. 
Um, that brings us to Connor Dolan. Connor is the Vice President um, of External Affairs for the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association. Connor, thanks for being here today. Really appreciate it. We'll turn it over to you. Absolutely. Thank you, Dan. And I really appreciate uh, you and ESI for hosting this. This is a great opportunity. Uh, this is actually my 15th uh, year coming to the uh, expo. I remember first coming as an intern very many years ago when hydrogen was uh, kind of a generous uh, you know, genesis of an idea. Uh, one of the first conversations I remember having at that time when I joined the association is that it's going to take four miracles for hydrogen to ever happen. That was actually coming from our Secretary of Energy at the time. We've certainly changed a lot since then. Uh, and I think we have now become a very bipartisan all of the above energy solution. And a big reason for that is because hydrogen is really viewed as being able to drive both economic growth as well as decarbonization. Um, so we are the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association. We are the national association for the hydrogen sector here in the United States. We have 100 member companies and we cover all aspects of hydrogen production, distribution, and end use. When I say we're the all of the above energy solutions, because you can make hydrogen from just about any energy source, we have folks producing hydrogen from fossil fuels with carbon capture and sequestration, nuclear power, renewables, solar, wind, hydropower. Uh, we have folks doing even geologic hydrogen, which are drilling uh, underground to find natural deposits of hydrogen. So we really cover what's called the full color spectrum of the hydrogen economy. Uh, we do try and focus less on the colors of hydrogen, as folks might have heard about green or blue or pink, yellow, whatever. Uh, we focus on clean hydrogen, whereas there's a wide range of ways of generating hydrogen with low carbon intensity. In addition, uh, when we talk about all of the above energy solution, hydrogen can be used for just about any energy application. We have folks uh, developing hydrogen for heating applications. Uh, it's been used for decades in industrial decarbonization for steel, cement, ammonia, methanol. These are some topics that were discussed on our last panel. Transportation, which was our the sustainable transportation panel right before this, had a number of folks mentioning hydrogen. But we have 15,000 hydrogen cars here in the United States today uh, in operation in California. There's dozens of fuel cell electric buses in operation at transit agencies around the country. Uh, we have uh, hydrogen trucks at ports uh, and then a variety of other transportation applications. Power generation is a big opportunity for hydrogen, particularly for seasonal energy storage, long-term and large-scale energy storage. Hydrogen is really viewed as one of the few viable options for that space. So there's a huge opportunity, uh, but I think we might need to take a quick... You can finish the thought. It's okay. Okay. I, I, okay. I'll just say that we can uh, take a break since I think we have a speaker that might have arrived. Um, and then we... Okay. I'll just wrap up. Uh, so hydrogen is really <laughs> critical to our energy future. Uh, there is a huge opportunity for uh, generating hydrogen here in the United States. Uh, there was a recent DOE Clean Hydrogen Roadmap that was released that said that we have an opportunity of developing 50 million metric tons of new clean hydrogen production and capacity here in the United States. That's going to generate 3.5 million jobs, reduce our carbon intensity by 16%, our NOx intensity by 36%. It's going to create and uh, account for 14% of US energy demand. The, re, you know, the benefits of this is really obvious. This is a domestic energy resource that can drive real energy independence and energy security. We can create jobs here, manufacturing capacity. There's a huge opportunity for scaling up this domestic energy solution. And that's going to be increasingly of interest because of this international competition in this space, particularly from China, Japan, Europe, Korea, are all investing billions of dollars in hydrogen. And we need to make sure that we are investing at least the same amount of capacity to make sure that we can keep up, if, if not take that and exceed that leadership position. Uh, finally, there, hydrogen is really the solution for hard to abate sectors. There's a lot of areas that electricity makes a lot of sense, but it doesn't work for every application. There's some uh, applications, particularly heavy duty, large scale, long, long haul transportation, industrial decarb and others, that hydrogen is really the only viable solution for that mass decarbonization that we need. So it is a really exciting industry to be in. We're really grateful for all the leadership in Congress, particularly with the bipartisan infrastructure law, the $8 billion being set aside for the hydrogen hubs. It's a massive opportunity to grow clean hydrogen production, distribution, and use around the country. The Section 45V tax credit for clean hydrogen production is a huge opportunity for scaling up our domestic hydrogen economy here in the United States. And we're really grateful to have so many champions here in Congress and looking forward to seeing where this industry go. Thank you, Connor. Uh, and yes, now we'll take a little bit of a break because we have a very special guest who's joining us. Um, Senator Peter Welch from Vermont is, uh, is with us. And Senator, you're not that far removed from the House of Representatives. So if this were a couple years ago, you'd have the day off. Right. Sorry that you're in session today, but we really, really appreciate your willingness to make your, the long way over here uh, to, the, to the House side. Um, 
You have a couple very, very important committee assignments. You're on the Committee on Agriculture, Chair of the Rural Development and Energy Subcommittee. Uh, you're also part of the, or a member of the Commerce, Science, and Transportation uh, Committee. Um, we've talked about energy efficiency earlier in the day, which is, uh, I think, about as close to your heart as you can get uh, and when it comes to clean energy policy. So we really appreciate your leadership there. I'll invite you up if you'd like to say a few words to our audience. We also have a robust online audience. Uh, and I understand you'd also be willing to take a question or two. I don't want to get in the way. Oh, no, you're fine. We'll pick people up who, with Charles. People who know what they're doing. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you. you. No, thank you, sir. Oh, well, just a couple of things. First of all, I'm really excited to be here, and I served on the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, for years uh, in, in the House. And you're right, energy efficiency uh, was a focus of my attention, and a lot of it had to do with the fact that that was the one place uh, where there was some potential to get a bipartisan support. My friend David McKinley from West Virginia, uh, coal mining West Virginia, was a tremendous ally on that. Uh, trying to do things directly, like they ultimately did with the Inflation Reduction Act, that was a little bit of a challenge. And I'll give a little background, backdrop of where we came from and where we're at and why what you're doing, ESI and each of you, uh, Connor, was interesting just listening to all the possibilities there. It's so important. When I came to Congress, which is 07, uh, there was a lot of climate change denial, right? Uh, I found that I had arrived from Vermont uh, which is totally uh, on a bipartisan basis into doing everything we can uh, for the environment uh, and where we believed in climate change. Uh, I arrived here and I uh, started associate, associating with some of the finest minds of the 17th century. And <laughs> <laughs> they denied climate change. What you talking about was kind of the attitude. And that was a real uh, boulder to push up the hill for quite a while. And when I first got here, they really didn't believe in it, the folks who were against it. They really didn't. And uh, as time went on, and as the evidence mounted, it became undeniable. I realized what the holdback, even more than just denial, was fear. It was fear about the dislocation that would occur in many communities uh, if we had to make the changes that are required to move us to a clean uh, renewable energy economy. Um, and, you know, that was real, too, to me, because I thought those of us who were pushing hard uh, for significant changes uh, in carbon emission reductions were a little slow to acknowledge that there were some real-world impacts. And uh, it's a reason why with Dave McKinley, who, as I mentioned, was a tremendous partner, I, he lives in coal country, and I took a trip with him and spent the weekend at his home and went down into a coal mine. And, uh, uh, and, and it was really compelling because the folks there that are working in those coal mines, I mean, they didn't create climate change, right? Uh, they're hardworking folks who care about the same thing you and I care about, and that's working hard, doing a good job, and being a member of the community and raising your family. And after we finished being in that coal mine, that was scary, by the way. Those guys worked harder than anybody but dairy farmers. Uh, and then they wanted to have a little fun with their member of Congress. So we're down 1,000 feet and we're riding in uh, five miles to where the uh, pit, where, the, where they were actually doing the mining, you get on those little railroad cars. Uh, they turn the lights off, all right? <laughs> it's dark <laughs> when you're 1,000 feet down. But we came out and had sat around and had a meal and was talking to the coal miners and just really, really wonderful people. And in that community, that on Friday nights, everyone would go to the local high school games. You know, a wonderful community event. Well, like 12 years before I was there, they used to have eight high schools. Now they were down to three. Mm -hmm. So there's real uh, pain there. And we can't, if we're gonna make progress, we have to acknowledge that reality. Now, fast forward, we passed the Inflation Reduction Act, and it was bipartisan. And it's extraordinary because it's the first time where, with public policy, we've acknowledged the existence of the problem, and we've supported solutions with significant public policy initiatives, including tax incentives, uh, that give a boost to starting to address uh, the issues that have to be faced in order to uh, bring down the carbon emissions, <coughs> hopefully to zero. 
That was hard, okay, to get that passed and painful. And it's a start. But the really hard work is what you're doing. That's why it's so important that you're here. Because the only way, ultimately, we're going to get over the fear that people have of dislocation, disruption in their communities, disruption in their way of life, is by making options for clean energy affordable and at scale. And it's really, that's the harder work. You know, as hard as it was for us uh, to legislatively pass this law, it's really much harder now to make these options affordable, available, and at scale so that people have the ability to affordably take advantage of clean energy options. And that's what I'm saying about the coal miners. You know, it's, it is disruption, but everybody who's on a family budget who clearly would prefer their kids to be able uh, to breathe clean air, uh, who clearly uh, are horrified about the extraordinary weather changes that we're having. In Vermont, by the way, this county, Washington County, which is where Montpelier, our capital is, it's in the top 10 areas with FEMA disaster declarations. That's Vermont. And you know, just years ago, people thought that was going to be a refuge. And we get these micro storms that are wiping out farms, that are wiping out homes. So what I find so exciting about what you're doing, and just it was interesting just listening to you talk about hydrogen, and I know each of you has something similar uh, that you're talking about doing at scale, is once we get to that tipping point where instead of fearing the problem, we embrace the, challenging, the challenge of solving the problem, that's actually where you start creating wealth. That's where you start getting a bit of a bounce in your step, that you're doing something that needs to be done, and by the doing of something that needs to be done, you're actually creating jobs, you're creating wealth, and you're creating, oh, by the way, a cleaner uh, and more sustainable environment. So that's what I see is the place we're at. We went from me arriving in 07, where there was real hard bedrock climate denial, to then resistance and fear, to the passage of legislation, and now the implementation that has to include research, engineering, and practical ways to make these options that have to be across the whole economy and across the way we live, uh, they all have to be addressed. So thank you so much uh, for your work, for your commitment to research, for your commitment to the very hard work of getting things done on a practical level that can be brought up to scale. So it's wonderful to be your partner in this long-term effort uh, to get to a zero emission economy and a stronger economy. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I'm, I'm, glad, you, I'm glad you mentioned your work with Representative McKinley. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the energy efficiency bills that eventually became part of you know, the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, okay. yeah. you've, you've kept doing that, and I just wanted to plug some work that you've been doing with Senator Murkowski around the Rural Energy right. Savings Act. Is there any Act. senator in the whole United States Senator better than Lisa Murkowski? I challenge you to tell me. <laughs> She's fantastic. Okay. That's a great, it's a great bill. It's one that we've worked with your office on, the Rural Energy Savings Act. It would improve the Rural Energy Savings Program. It's something we talked a little bit about on our Rural and Tribal Communities panel a little bit. But I mention that because it's great, but also because it's another example of your willingness to work across the aisle. So thank you for that. Um, you mentioned you might have time for a question or yeah, two. So sure. I'm going to look for hands. We have a microphone in the room. Um, I'm going to get us started. So Senator, I, um, we didn't have a chance to connect, but I'm from Graniteville, 05654, in the heart of Washington County. My, I grew up there, and the floods have just been awful. And we were up in Swanton for our family vacation a couple weeks ago. Um, how are things going up there? How are communities well, it's, you know, recovering? It's, how, how are they, they feeling? It's terrible. Okay, you know, when you, we had these floods. We had a huge flood in 2011, the worst since 1927. Then in 2023 in July, we had these huge floods. And then 2024, a year to the day later, people were wiped out in Barry. The floods came back. And when people would ask me here, and, and all the members, are, they're, they're empathetic to the weather events that happen in all of our districts. 
you know, it was hard to answer it in a way because on the one level, after the immediate trauma, yep, and if FEMA's there, uh, it, there's a there's there's an immediate response where emotionally you're feeling supported by everybody in your community, but then two weeks in, life goes on for everybody else. But if it's your home, if it's your farm, uh, if it's your business, it got flooded out. I mean, it is hard. And then we had that in July of 2023, and in July of 2024, 20, to the same date, a lot of those same communities, a lot of those same businesses, and a couple of the same farms were hit again. And that is truly exhausting. It's really wearing people down, asking the question of, wait, if this is going to keep happening, and it's a reasonable expectation that it will keep happening, right? You know, you somehow think it won't. But then when it does and then it does again, then, you know, you, you know. So it's, 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 it, it wears you down a bit uh, and it takes its toll. So uh, we're doing all we can, but it's tough. And the idea that we're going to dodge uh, the consequences the, uh, rippling out throughout the economy of these weather events is obviously naive. And for Vermont, it's these micro storms. Like right now, St. Johnsbury got flooded because it was nine inches of rain in just one little location. Okay, so this is weird. I mean, the state paid more or less. I mean, I live in Norwich, about 60 miles from St. Johnsbury. We just got a little rain that we needed. But up there, it all concentrated, and we've got these valleys. So all, all the water comes rushing down, the storms rise, and then cause the real damage. Uh, but if you're in Hawaii, it's the fires. If you're in California right now, it's the fires. If, if you're in Houston, it's this constant water that's coming up. So times are wasted, and we we know that we're all in this together. But it's gonna it's it's gonna continue this work that you all are doing. Yes, sir. We have a question in the front. Uh, Lindsay will bring over a mic. Thanks. Hi. Thanks for coming down. Um, I'm curious if you wake up in 2024 and. Legislatively, everything looks exactly how you want. What's next? What's the big next priority that you feel is uh, either untackled by IRA and Bill, et cetera, or is just something that needs to be expanded upon? Well, you know, where we are legislatively, I think there's two things. One, I really do think the implementation issues that have to be addressed by the private sector are absolutely critical, okay? Because we've got to make it affordable. But we also know that there's got to be some significant process changes. Like, we've got to have better transmission. I also think we've got to look at our permitting system. I'm a strong person that favors uh, protecting uh, environmental and health values and having a process by which you do that. But I want an answer sooner rather than later, OK? And I think those of us who believe that uh, something like transmission lines are really essential to get clean energy from where it can be produced. Uh, to where it's needed, have to do that. It's just like in housing. We've got to make it easier to build houses, right? We got a housing shortage. We got to build houses. So how do we do that? And that means taking a look at some of the procedures that um, a lot on my side have relied on regulatory uh, 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 issues that have a legitimate purpose, but sometimes in application do some do some harm. Well, thank you, Senator Welch. Thank that you. was very nice of you to stop by. We know it's a busy day over there in the Senate, so thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks to your staff. Uh, Evelyn, if you're watching, Lucas, if you're watching. Um, thanks uh, for being great partners. I'm going to take my microphone back down here. We're sharing today. I don't know why, but we're sharing today. Um, Charles? Uh, Sorry that there was a bit of an interruption in the program. Interruption? I mean, I, I'm about to leave here and say I got introduced by a senator. That, that's not bad. That's a great spin. I will back you up on that. It basically means we get to restart the panel and Sia gets the first word. Absolutely. So Charles Bolden is no stranger to ESI panels, Senior Director of Congressional Affairs, the Solar Energy Industries Association. Charles, it's always so great to see you. Turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Dan. Uh, I, I would like to start off by saying um, thank you to you and all the work that EESI does. It is always an honor and privilege to be here today. Um, and like I said, I used to work in these hallways, so I used to dream of doing this. And now I'm in front of everyone uh, talking about my area of expertise. What I'm here share with some gurus, so it's, it's always good. Um, so just a quick overview of SIA. Uh, we are the largest solar and storage trade association with over 1,200 member companies. Um, we recently passed over 5 million 
solar installations across the United States. Um, we have about 230,000 jobs across the United States in our, uh, in our industry. Uh, 2023 was a record year for the solar industry uh, with 35 gigawatts installed. Um, of note, 13 gigawatts was installed in Q4 alone, uh, and domestic module manufacturing nearly doubled from 8 to 16. Uh, gigawatts uh, last year. So with that, I do want to get into a little speech that I put together. Um, as we stand here at a pivotal moment in history, our world faces unprecedented challenges from climate change, rising energy costs, and an urgent need for sustainable development. Solar energy offers a powerful solution to these issues, providing clean, renewable power that can be harnessed globally. Let's consider the environmental benefit. And environmental benefits. Solar energy is one of the cleanest sources of energy available. As glaciers melt and sea levels rise, and let's face it, the DMV is on fire, uh, the importance of transitioning to clean energy sources cannot be overstated. Moreover, solar energy is abundant and accessible. The sun provides more energy in an hour than the world consumes in a year. Harnessing even a fraction of this energy can meet the global energy demand many times over. Advances in solar technology have made it possible to capture and convert sunlight into electricity more efficiently and cost effectively than ever before. Solar panels can now be integrated into a variety of settings. Panels can now be uh, from rooftops in urban areas to vast solar farms and deserts, making it a versatile solution for diverse energy needs. And manufacturing, installation, maintenance, and research and development. According to recent reports, the solar sector employs millions of people worldwide. Over 200,000, over 230,000 in the U.S. contributing to the economic growth and stability. As the, as the cost of solar panels continues to decline and manufacturing deployment increases here in the U.S. because of policies like the IRA, the return on, on the investment for solar energy projects become increasingly attractive spurring further adoption and innovation. Furthermore, solar energy enhances energy security. By diversifying our energy sources and reducing our reliance on imported fossil fuels, we can build a more resilient and self-sufficient energy infrastructure. This particularly is important for regions that are currently dependent on energy imports as it reduces vulnerability to geopolitical tensions and price validity. In the face of natural disasters, or natural or supply disruption, solar power can provide a reliable and decentralized energy source, ensuring that communities have access to electricity when they most need it. On the global scale, solar energy has the potential to bridge the energy access gap. Solar power offers a scalable and sustainable solution to bring electricity to remote and underserved areas. Solar microgrids and off-grid solar systems can provide reliable power for lighting, communication, and essential services, transforming lives and enabling economic development in some of the nation's most disadvantaged communities. As we look to the future, continued, as we look to the future, continued investment in solar research and development will be critical. Innovations in energy storage, grid integration, and solar panel efficiency will drive the next wave of solar adoption. Public policies and incentives play a vital role and accelerating this transition. Government, businesses, and communities must work together to create an enabling environment that supports the growth of the solar industry. Solar energy is more than just a technical, technological innovation. It is a beacon of hope for a sustainable and prosperous future. It addresses our environmental challenges, drives economic growth, enhances energy security, promotes social equity, and and the importance of solar energy across the globe cannot be overstated. In short, SIA is an organization of dreamers, believers, and leaders. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. That was great. Absolutely. Uh, that brings us to our fifth panelist of the panel, Carl Husker. Carl is a senior fellow for energy and climate at the World Resources Institute. Carl, welcome. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Dan, and uh, also I want to commend EESI for bringing great uh, factual events, informed opinions uh, to the Hill and to the media and others. Uh, and yes, I was once a Hill staffer out in those seats. I can't remember when. It was, it was not this century, maybe the <laughs> late 1900s, but way back, way back there. 
I'm here to tell you a little bit about geothermal power, particularly advanced geothermal power, or what we sometimes call next generation geothermal power, which has uh, great, great potential. I'll, I'll, talk, I'll touch a little bit on the technology itself, its potential, uh, the environmental impacts that we have to pay attention to, and then how it fits uh, into the grids of the future. So as many of you know, uh, we've had geothermal power for many decades. We have about four gigawatts in the US right now, and it's uh, a thermal source. We bring up super hot water from naturally forming uh, natural reservoirs, uh, we spin turbines, we create electricity, uh, and with no CO2, which is great. But the key is we've been relying so far on natural reservoirs that just occur in a few places around the globe. What's new is that advanced drilling techniques now allow us to create reservoirs underground suitable for geothermal power. And ironically, it's actually some of the innovations that come from the oil and gas industry in terms of hydraulic fra fracturing and directional uh, horizontal drilling that have actually enabled this uh, new zero carbon source. So uh, uh, reflect on the irony of that. So what, what are we able to do with these new drilling techniques in terms of geothermal? This, they, they fall in three categories. One is really becoming commercial as we speak. We call it enhanced geothermal systems. And that's where we create fissures in rock deep below the surface, maybe one to two miles down. Uh, we drill a well that then puts water down uh, into those new fissures, and then a second will, well that pumps back up the extreme hot water that be, can become steam and spin a turbine. Um, the second type is more at the demonstration phase. It's called a closed loop system. Uh, and in this case, you literally have just sort of a single uh, pipe going down and coming back up where the, uh, the heated rock far below the surface uh, heats a fluid, uh, heats water inside a closed pipe, brings it back to the surface. That's going to go down maybe five miles or more, but we're now working on early demonstrations of that. The third uh, option, which is really more at the R&D stage, is called super hot rock. And that is drilling even further down, perhaps as deep as 12 miles, to access rock that is 400 degrees centigrade. And we need new drilling techniques. We need new materials to access that. But between these three approaches, we can greatly expand the geographic reach of this zero carbon electricity source. Uh, DOE uh, has a great uh, report on this also in the liftoff series that I'd recommend to you. Uh, DOE has a lab and a demo, uh, demonstration site in Utah. We have companies like Fervo and Ever starting to sign contracts with large electricity bars like Google uh, for these, uh, these commercializable technologies. Uh, DOE thinks that we can create maybe 100 to 300 gigawatts of advanced geothermal by 2050 which would uh, supply a significant piece of the clean, firm, dispatchable power that we need for a clean grid to build on what Malcolm said about how hydro also needs to complement heavy solar and wind grids in the future. Geothermal can do the same. Environmental impacts, I'm glad to say that it, they are fairly minimal. Um, first, we gotta realize that all energy production creates some environmental impacts, so it's about managing those impacts. The land footprint of geothermal is quite small. It has minimal conventional air emissions uh, and uh, very little solid waste creation. It has a minimal consumption of water. Once you fill your loop with water, you continue to recycle it uh, as steam and water. It doesn't consume water beyond that and there's little risk of water contamination because we are drilling deep below groundwater formations. The thing we have to pay most attention to is the possibility of inducing minor earthquakes. This is something that, of course, we've run into with unconventional oil and gas drilling too. Uh, the good news there is that this type of uh, exploration underground does not typically create more and more pressure you, you, fra you fracture the rock and then you manage the system. Whereas most of the induced seismicity connected with unconventional oil and gas production 
is driven by the wastewater wells where the companies keep pumping more and more wastewater into the ground, increase pressure, and can result in earthquakes of the magnitude of three to four on the Richter scale. So this is probably a manageable risk, and DOE has developed protocols uh, to, to minimize that. I'll close by just really, I want to echo what, uh, what Malcolm said about the need for clean, firm, dispatchable power. It provides grid services beyond what solar and wind can do. And so we need to make sure we bring these options along, like uh, additional hydro, geothermal, nuclear, gas with CCS, and sometimes burning hydrogen in turbines as a, as a peaking and balancing resource. All credible modeling and analysis of 100% clean grids show we can go 60, 70, 80, maybe 90% solar and wind, in, uh, depending on the grid, but we need to complement it with clean, firm sources. So I'll stop there and look forward to questions. You mentioned earthquakes. I was wondering, well, what about if we come across like mole people, depending on how far <laughs> we go down? And what about if they're not friendly? Um, then we'll, you know, that, but um, earthquakes, yes, I can see that. We have to be careful there. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to look around and see if I see any hands go up as I've been doing. Lindsay has the microphone. Um, oh, we have a question right there. Uh, a couple rows back, Lindsay. Thank you all so much for coming today. Um, I actually had a kind of a couple of questions for Carl. Um, first of all, like what kind of, you know, at like an economic scale, like what would be like the cost to a homeowner to like install one of these systems? And then also like, I know with global warming, obviously we're talking about the planet heating up, but like there's a real need um, for home heating still. And a lot of home heating is still, you know, carbon intensive using natural gas or other things. And so I was curious as to kind of what the viability of maybe geothermal for home heating, if you had any thoughts mm -hmm. on that. Yeah, the, the systems I described are, are large in industrial scale. They're generating 20, 50, uh, 100 megawatts or more, so that they don't have a home ap application. You're probably thinking of, um, I forget the exact label for, like a geo, <coughs> geo heat pump, so something, there, there are things that can be sized for individual homes uh, or buildings, which are also a very promising way to heat a building uh, carbon free. But I will just key off on one thing uh, you said that I didn't include in my presentation is that one of the interesting things about these advanced geothermal systems is that they are capable of producing both electricity and heat on a large scale that then could be distributed in like a distributed heating system. So. Great, thanks. Um, let's see, uh, I'm gonna sort of piggyback on that. He mentioned that there's multiple benefits. Um, I'm curious, uh, sort of, um, Eric, maybe it makes sense to come back with you, and, and maybe we can go down the line with this. But you know, there are different scales, right? There's, there's sort of like, when we're talking about what's, I guess, Connor, you were the one talking about scale, right? There's big scale, um, and then there's sort of small scale. And then in the middle, there are you know, sort of like average project sizes. Um, what do you, what are the, what do the different markets look like in wind? Hydropower might be a little difficult, but I'm curious. You know, since there is such a big difference in geothermal and maybe people's minds go, and same thing with solar, right? There's big solar systems versus er, solar projects versus smaller ones. Any additional thoughts on the panel about like sort of what different what your technologies look like at different scales and how they might be how they might be different? Like other than the fact that they're you know photovoltaics or photovoltaics, but differences that might come with at different sizes with different scales. Yeah, I, I can give a quick uh, quick first response here. Um, I would say for, for wind energy, um, we are the wind energy technologies office. So that means we span everything from kilowatt scale that could be for a, a home residential system or a farm application, all the way up to you know gigawatt scale offshore wind plants or maybe even gigawatt scale land-based wind plants uh, where there's abundant land. Um, and so we have research and uh, development activities as well as deployment focused activities at, at all those scales. Uh, certainly the most ubiquitous is our land-based wind kind of 100, 200 megawatt type facilities that you might see driving on an interstate highway through the Great Plains. Uh, I'm sure you've been following the news about offshore wind as well. Uh, but you know, in terms of where we're really focusing and where I would be really excited to see growth is we, we've talked a little bit about sort of the community level impacts on this panel and we heard from the Senator as well talking about the role of communities in experiencing climate change and being involved in energy transition. And um, I would love to see increased growth at the community scale for wind energy. I think that's 
community and distributed applications would be a great way uh, to, to make those people more a part of the, of the energy transition uh, and to see themselves as uh, having an active role to play there. Uh, so while we continue to do work at all scales and from sort of an overall emissions reductions perspective, those gigawatt scale facilities mm -hmm. onshore and offshore are really important. Uh, I, think, I don't think we can ignore the smaller scales too, even though their overall energy contributions are smaller. They're just so important for helping people experience and buy into the broader concept of energy transition. Thanks, Eric. Um, Malcolm, Connor, uh, Charles, any other thoughts about like what this looks like at different scales within your sector, within your industry? I'll jump in for a moment. Um, uh, as National Hydropower Association, we also represent a whole array of marine energy technologies, wave, tidal, current technologies. And when you think about the energy transition, we want this to be for all. So for example, there's a really cool project in Iggy Agig, Alaska. You know, there's no grid there. You can't balance it out, but you're able to put a system in the, in the river, provides 24-7 power, fish just swim around it. It's wonderful. So different scale projects. Uh, there's a, some innovative technology in the hydro space for conduits. All the irrigation dishes, uh, uh, Denver Water System is putting this in all of their pipes for their water system. You can get power from all of that. Uh, the problem is, is really the cost of transmission. Um, just all the interconnections is, uh, makes the, uh, the ROI not quite there yet. But I think there's a whole revolution in the water power space I don't want folks to uh, overlook. Well, I was just going to say one thing that I appreciate about solar so much is that it is it is really uh, championing uh, solar projects in underserved communities. So when you think about community solar projects um, that are usually in disadvantaged communities or you talk about um, what what uh, one of our board members, Gilbert Campbell, has done, he's put solar panels on the first HBCU at Howard University. I think things like that make me really excited about the future of solar. Now, scale wise, I mean, we have we we represent battery storage uh, companies as well, um, but utility scale, it's always great to see um, the way that farmers and solar collaborate, creating additional revenue for the farmers um, for for their for their properties, but also. Um, giving back to to the communities uh, around there. So th that's the excitement that I have for solar and the, and the scale that it brings and provides. You know, I think the hydrogen and fuel cell sector is really all about scale. For, you know, stationary power generation, we have systems that are in a few watts, kilowatts, powering uh, remote cell towers, providing backup power. We have, you know, the next scale up is kind of the data center, grocery store, university backup power, primary power. We even have you know tens of megawatts of fuel cells deployed at different substations as basically neighborhood power, powering ten, fifteen thousand uh, dollars, thousand homes in a uh, neighborhood. Uh, on the hydrogen production side, we have on-site small-scale hydrogen production. We get to larger-scale electrolyzers. Ultimately, we're going to be getting into the gigawatt scale. We're very much underway with a number of gigawatt-scale factories in development here in the United States to start really ramping up electrolyzer development. On transportation, we run everything from forklifts, there's 60,000 forklifts powered by hydrogen in the United States, to cars, buses, trucks, and heavy duty port, port equipment. Uh, ultimately, you know, as we continue to scale, you know, we're gonna be not just producing enough hydrogen for use here in the United States, but there's also a huge opportunity for exporting that hydrogen abroad. We are he seeing huge demands from hydrogen in Korea and Japan that have limited domestic resources. They're gonna be looking for hydrogen. Right now, uh, Japan's even, importing coal-based hydrogen from Australia. So finding ways of exporting clean hydrogen to around uh, the world is going to be a very interesting aspect of this kind of scalability conversation. Great, thanks. We are just about at time, uh, and I want to make sure we have time to transition to our next panel. But um, Carl, maybe we could do a quick lightning round. We can start with you, and then maybe we end with Larry, Eric. What's one thing five years from now you would like to say that has been accomplished in the, in the, the large scale or enhanced geothermal or other advanced geothermal technology, and then we'll come down the line. Uh, can I duck the question or make it broader? The thing that I'd like to see five years from now, we, uh, uh, people have alluded to the incredible demand growth we're seeing uh, from data centers, from artificial intelligence, from transportation, building electrification. Uh, it is gonna be hard to keep up with that growth and one of the, the paths of least resistance by utilities and IPPs will be just to build uncontrolled gas. So to me, the, a, a, we have lots of short-term challenges, but one of them is to make sure that our emission, we don't just bust through our emission ceilings because we go on that path of least resistance. So hence the implementation of all the IR incentives, building out solar and wind and enhancing uh, our existing hydro facilities and getting hydrogen and geothermal 
and all the other zero carbon sources off the ground, we need to lean into that. Otherwise, we're busting all of our 2030, 2035 emission goals. Charles, one thing you'd like to see? Uh, I can't give you one, but I can give you a uh, quick, quick two. Um, the, the, the one thing that I would like to see right now is uh, domestic manufacturing, just you know, a lot of the, the solar panels and, and modules being produced in the United States. But the second thing, most important, near and dear to my heart, is to diversify not just in this industry, but the hydrogen industry, uh, the wind industry. I think that we need to partner with HBCUs. I think it's important um, to bring and, and lift communities up uh, by showing the technology to them, but also getting them involved. And I think that those are the major things that I would like to see. Great. Okay. Connor? Yeah, I think uh, I would like to see hydrogen, you know, the United States be the leader in hydrogen. I think that we are certainly setting us up for success on that with the $8 billion going to hydrogen hubs, the $1.5 billion set aside for clean hydrogen manufacturing and electrolysis, setting aside, you know, certain monies for industrial decarbonization. We're seeing a lot of initial investments in this space. We have a huge potential with this credit for clean hydrogen production, 45V, which has been you know, our number one priority for many years now. But we need to make sure we get these policies right. We need to make sure that the rules are promulgated in a way that helps benefit and provides flexibility for the industry to grow and prosper to, to achieve that. And I do have my biggest fear is that if we don't have the right policies in place, we are going to see this technology like we've seen others to China and other countries that are going to kind of eat our lunch. Malcolm, and then we'll go to Eric. Uh, my hope that in five years, the, the clean energy transition is providing affordable, reliable, clean energy. Um, and that uh, from a hydropower perspective, uh, we certainly see hydropower as an essential part of a 24 seven reliable grid. And so that means that first you've preserved the existing fleet. We've got that uh, half of the federal, half of the hydropower fleet is up for relicensing of the non-federal fleet. So we've got to preserve that fleet and take advantage of opportunities for pump storage and other new generation to be able to complement wind and solar. Gosh, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to pick one. Um, maybe I'll piggyback just a little bit. I think I heard a call for domestic manufacturing. I think we'd love to see uh, additional domestic manufacturing and wind components, especially as we're scaling to three to five X sort of recent average annual installation levels. Um, one thing I haven't talked very much about, though, is floating offshore wind. I think it'd be great to see a, uh, a large scale, you know, at least tens of megawatts floating offshore wind facility in the U.S. in five years. Aim, aim big, right? Why not? Thank you so much to Eric, Malcolm, Connor, Charles, and Carl. Thank you very much. Great panel.